good evening dear friends ladies and gentlemen national gallery of modern art bengaluru ministry of culture government of india in collaboration with gandhi center for science and human values welcomes you for today's virtual talk on indian heritage and astrophysics by dr siraj hasan former director indian institute of astrophysics to introduce professor siraj hasan former formerly director at the institute indian institute of astrophysics in bangalore is well known in india and abroad for his distinguished academic and research work in astrophysics hasan began his education at mayo college ajmer and carried out his undergraduate studies at aligarh museum muslim university where he earned a bsc honors in physics after obtaining his msc in physics in 1972 from delhi university Hassan went on to the Department of Theoretical Physics at the University of Oxford, UK for a doctorate in astrophysics which is received in 1977. The acclaimed theorist theoretical physicist Dr. Ted Hart guided his research work at Oxford. In 1977, Hassan joined the Indian Institute of Astrophysics Bangalore first as a visiting fellow and later as a permanent staff member the following year. In 2006 he took over as a director of the institute Hassan has held visiting faculty position in many premium international institutions such as University of Cambridge Harvard Oxford and London he has been a recipient of prestigious international fellowships including the commonwealth alexander one hambolt and smithsonian fellowships he is a life member of clare hall college cambridge and was an associate of Harvard College Observatory at Harvard Hassan's research specializes specialization in physics of the sun an area in which he has contributed ex- extensively he has guided several graduate students for the phd work as well as well as supervised a number of post doctorates Hassan is a member of a many professional bodies and societies He was chairman of governing council of Vishweshwarya Technology Museum Bangalore from 2008 to 2015 and has served on the board of many institutions such as Aries Nainital Bose Institute Kolkata and IUCAA Pune currently he is the member of governing council of the Institute for Plasma Research Gandhinagar and NIAS Bangalore I welcome today's speaker Professor Siraj Hassan uh up to you sir uh thank you very much uh, mr darshan kumar for those kind words and good evening ladies and gentlemen i am indeed honored to be asked by the ngma and the gandhi science center to give this talk on the indian heritage in astrophysics the scope of this topic is so vast as you must all understand that it is impossible in this short time to do justice to even a portion of it so i have decided to be somewhat selective and take a few representative ideas which are particularly relevant in the national context i will focus mainly on modern astrophysics in india uh, by modern i mean after the advent of the telescope in the 17th century and i will also talk about later on about contemporary developments in india and also if time permits in the end about future mega projects so let's get started and let me share my screen so what is astrophysics well before i begin to define astrophysics let me just say that ever since antiquity man has always wondered about the universe his place in the universe and from a practical point of view astronomy had many advantages it helped him to find the time to plant crops to take to build a calendar to do navigation uh many other activities religious festivals were an important activity so but from a operational point of view astronomy or astrophysics as the terms today are used somewhat interchangeably uh is concerned with the uh, stars their positions their brightness planets solar systems galaxies the milky way uh, 
the origin of the universe? I mean, there are so many other questions. Uh, primarily, uh, the way astrophysics works is it tries to create theories of what is going on in the universe and then tries to match these with uh, observations. And that's very important because until you can not match, have a good match between theory and observations, you really don't have a good understanding of what's going on in the universe. Just as an illustration, let me just show you of the kind of... Uh, objects or images that we study, structures that we study in astrophysics. The top is a, shows basically four pictures of nebulae. Nebulae are basically regions between stars in the interstellar space, which, have, which are formed of gas clouds. Gas by gas, I mean basically hydrogen. And these are the places where star formation takes place. The bottom is a very spectacular image of a supernova explosion that uh, exploded in the constellation of Cassiopeia. Uh, I think it's uh, a good idea when one discusses any subject to at least try to talk a little bit about the historical aspects. Now, I'm going to talk about Greek astronomy and Greek astronomy actually influenced astronomy all over the world, including Indian astronomy. So one of the most influential astronomers of that period was Aristotle who postulated that the universe can basically be divided broadly into two parts. The Earth, of course, had a central position, and then you had nested spheres, or what are concentric spheres, uh, which were the perfect heavens, which was the rest of the universe. Now, the first, actually, model of the heliocentric that is questioning this whole model, uh, that is the the heliocentric model means that the sun is at the center, was actually put forward by Aristarchus, who actually made also many other important contributions to astronomy. But unfortunately, nobody took it seriously. Um, another Greek, Aristosthenes, found this ingenious way to measure the circumference of the Earth to a rather accurate value. And he did this basically by comparing the shadow at two places, Cyan and Alexandria, and knowing the distance between them and doing a little bit of trigonometry, he was able to arrive at a number which is, uh, which is reasonably close to the actual number. Now, Hipparchus was another very influential astronomer in Greek times. Uh, the first catalog, he was, I think, the first person to compile a star catalog. Uh, he actually uh, computed very accurately the length of the year, the precession of equinoxes and so on. Uh, and today's uh, star catalogs are actually named after Hipparchus. They bear his name as a tribute to what he did. And the first purely solar calendar was also developed by the Greeks. Now, you must have all heard of Ptolemy, he undoubtedly had, I think, the longest uh, influence on astronomy for centuries. In fact, right up from the first of uh, the second century, right up to the 16th century. And he presented his uh, main ideas in this famous book called the Almagest, uh, which uh, basically elaborates on his model of uh, the Earth being at the center of the solar of the solar system, the Sun orbiting the Earth, and then there was this, of course, this rather difficult problem of trying to understand the retrograde motion. The retrograde motion was the motion of the planets apparently going in the other direction, and he did this rather ingeniously through a, a method called epicycles. I'm not going to go into the detail, but this figure in front actually shows you that the planets have two motions: one with their centers going around the Earth, and then the other uh, going around their own centers, which is, the, which is what is called the epicycle. Now, let me turn to Indian astronomy. Uh, Indian astronomy actually goes back a long way, uh, right up to the Indus Valley civilization, the time of the Rig Vedas around 1500 BC. And uh, Perhaps one of the oldest uh, books texts which has survived from that time is the Vedanga Jyotisha by La Lagar, uh, written around 1400 BC, which in fact uh, is the basis for the traditional Indian calendar. But uh, let me actually focus more 
from the period of, of about 5500 AD. And this map on the right actually gives the names of a large number of uh, Indian astronomers who contributed extensively to the development of uh, astronomy in ancient times. Uh, I'll only select a few of them, which is not to say that the other people did not make important contributions. Now, the, perhaps most of you have heard of Aryabhatta the first, um, who lived between 476 and 550 AD. His works are presented in his um, monograph called Arya Bhatya, which was written in 499 AD. And uh, he, he really handled, he did looked at a large number of problems. I'm just mentioning a few of them. In astronomy, he also made uh, very significant contributions in mathematics. But in astronomy, he looked at planetary motion, explanation of eclipses and their predictions. And in uh, mathematics, he looked at spherical geometry, uh, trigonometric, he compiled trigonometric tables, calculation of pi, which was uh, correct to uh, eight significant places. He also calculated the circumference of the earth fairly accurately. Um, and his, uh, actually uh, his works had a profound influence, not only to people within India, but all over in the, to the Arab world and subsequently to the rest of the world. Um, a contemporary of his, Ibarra Mira, he refined uh, many principles of Greek astronomy. Um, uh, I should just mention that uh, actually uh, the Greek ideas actually started coming into India from around uh, the fourth century, particularly after the invasion of Alexander in 326 BC. So many of these ideas had already infiltrated within the country and had been uh, uh, quite well studied within, in India. We now turn to Brahma Gupta a century later, who calculated the, most of the, I mean, as you will see the recurring theme in all the works was in astronomy, was on the motion of planets, on eclipses, and so on. And his works, uh, his famous work, the Brahma Sutta Siddhanta, uh, along with that of Aryabhatta, had a great influence on Arab astronomy. Uh, a contemporary of his, Bhaskara the first, worked out uh, very accurately planetary longitudes, uh, the conjunction amongst planets and stars, eclipses, and phases of the moon. Uh, and uh, Bhaskara II, um, several centuries later, in the 12th century actually, again worked on many of these topics. He refined the formulas and uh, the improved methods of calculating many of these phenomena. In the 14th century, um, astronomer Mahinder Suri uh, developed ideas for drawing an astrolabe. An astrolabe is basically a uh, handheld model of the universe. Astrolabes had been around actually for several centuries, uh, but uh, every civilization had its own, you know, made it, had its own particular way of doing, uh, making astrolabes. And uh, finally, uh, last but not least, uh, I should also mention that there was a very, uh, there was a thriving school in Kerala in which uh, several astronomers worked. Notably, I'll mention just two of them. One is Parameshwara uh, in 1360, who worked on the eclipse computations. And the other is Nilakantha, who revised Aryabhatta's model for the planets. So now we start from the Greeks. We see many of these Greek ideas actually spreading, proliferating to different parts of the world. They come to India. And then from India, many of these ideas move to other parts. For example, they move to the Arab, air, to, to, to countries in, 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 in the Arab world. And the main developments in the Arab world took place during what is called the, the golden age between the ninth and 13th centuries, following the translation of, uh, of various Indian and other astronomical works. And the main centers were in Baghdad and, Baghd and Damascus. And of course, many of you might have heard of the House of Wisdom 
which was set up by the Abbasid Caliph al mamun in the ninth century. So I'm going to again be somewhat selective and talk about uh, a few of the very prominent uh, Arab astronomers who made notable uh, contributions. Um, the first one is al Khawarizmi, uh, who in the eighth century, eighth and ninth centuries, um, combined compiled astronomical tables, basically which were based on the original Sanskrit, the Indian uh, tables. And these were used for calculating solar, solar, lunar, and planetary motions. Of course, they were still working within the geocentric, that is the old Ptolemy model. Al Fargani in the ninth century, he corrected the work of, uh, of the earlier Arab astronomers. He provided rev revised values for the oblique, obliquity of the eclipt, ecliptic, the Earth's circumference. And Ibn Hitam, who in the 10th century, I think he was the first uh, Arab astronomer who challenged the model of Ptolemy. Again, the, the, helio, the geocentric model about the earth being at the center. Uh, but again, the, these ideas were really not taken very seriously. He's regarded as the father of modern optics, a field in which he made tremendous contributions. I will not be talking about those, but he also made uh, significant uh, contributions to Arab astronomy. Now, Al-Biruni is probably one of the most versatile Arab astronomers. He was, apart from being an astronomer, he was a mathematician, a geographer. He studied comparative religion. He visited India, spent several years here. He, could, uh, he was conversant in Sanskrit. So he was, uh, in a sense, uh, a person who was accomplished in many fields, so a, a scientist and a philosopher. Uh, he used the astrolabe to tell time, basically uh, dividing the arc sexagesimally, that is using the base 60, that is into minutes and seconds. Uh, he provided data on eclipses, uh, which he used to study the phases of the moon. And this figure that you see on the right is uh, Al-Biruni's drawing in which he attempts to explain the phases of the moon. And again, his works, he was influenced uh, uh, greatly by Aryabhatta and Brahma Gupta. And uh, the final um, astronomer that I'm going to talk about is uh, Tusi. Now, Tusi also made a large number of contributions. Uh, in addition to the fact that he was uh, very influential in getting an observatory set up uh, called the Maraga Observatory, which is in Azerbaijan. But other than that, uh, he created what is called the Tusi couple. Um, and the Tusi couple was a, a rather clever way of uh, depicting the solution, la the latitudinal motion of the inferior planets, that is the planets like Mercury and Venus. Um, and the Tusi, the Tusi couple is basically uh, a circle moving inside another circle of twice the radius and the motion which you can, uh, it, it maps a particular type of motion depending on whether you're on the circumference or whether you're inside. Anyway, I don't want to go into those type of details, but these were quite, uh, the, these, were, these, these were used for, for studying the, the planetary motions. It's also believed that uh, he may have influenced Copernicus later on, but it's, not rigorously proved that Copernicus was influenced by him, but many people have found that uh, when you look at the writings of Thusi and you look at the writings of Copernicus, that there are some similarities, but I don't want to go into that. Uh, at the bottom is, is a beautiful picture of an astrolabe. You know, apart from the functional aspect of astrolabes, they were also somewhat ornamental. So people tried to, to make, uh, uh, astrolabes, which actually look very elegant. And this is one of those. Now, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. So I'm going to now talk about the medieval observatories. And the first one that uh, I want to uh, present to you is the observatory built by uh, Uluk Beg um, in the 15th century. Uh, Uluk Beg, incidentally, was the grandson of Tamerlane, and he's well known for his work in astronomy and mathematics. 
uh, in mathematics, particularly in trigonometry and spherical geometry. Uh, this observatory that he built, unfortunately, was destroyed in 1449 after his assassination. Uh, but it was rediscovered in 1908 by a Russian archaeologist. And what remains uh, today are basically some ruins, but the underground portions, quite a lot of the underground portions are intact. And the observatory consisted basically of, uh, of a three-story building, which had uh, three instruments. And the main one was a, was a sextant. And the important point to note is that the sextant had was a huge one. It had a very long arm. And because of this long arm, the astronomers there were able to achieve a very accurate, were able to make very accurate observations uh, to what astronomers call, uh, if you look at, if you want to be a little more rigorous, to within 36 arc seconds. And that's, for that time, an extremely good measurement. Uh, the observatory also contributed uh, to star catalogs containing thousands of stars. And um, this, one should remember, was at a time 200 years before the advent of telescopes. Now, I'm going to, uh, again, move a few centuries forward. But before I talk about the Jantar Mantar, I should mention that in the medieval period in India, there was a considerable amount of interest in astronomy. Uh, Humayun, for instance, uh, built a small observatory. Um, I think it's called uh, Gyara Siri. Uh, uh, but uh, I mean, it was, it did not uh, really, could not compete with, for example, the, uh, the other ones which I just talked about. But nevertheless, there was interest in astronomy. And there was also an interest in building celestial globes. Uh, now, having said that, let me come to the first sort of serious uh, observatory that was built in during that era. And that was built by Maharaja Savai Jai Singh. Uh, and the first one was in Delhi uh, in 1724. And you can see a picture of the Jantar Mantar on the right of the screen. Um, he built uh, four others in Jaipur, Mathura, Ujjain, and Varanasi. Unfortunately, the one in Mathura got destroyed around 1857, close to the time of the War of Independence, but the others survived. He also attempted to revise the tables of Ulugbeg. Uh, I don't want to go into the technical aspects about the observatory, but the main point was that it had a massive sundial very, very large. And again, it was this large, uh, because of this large arm, that it was able to achieve a good resolution. And these were used basically to uh, create ast astronomical tables and almanacs, which were, of course, which had both um, scientific and also other <laughs> uh, applications. Now, as I had advertised in my preamble, uh, the focus of my talk is actually on modern astrophysics. And uh, so I'm going to um, start off with uh, uh, Copernicus, who is actually the first person who completely took turned the subject upside down. And that was he rejected the model of Ptolemy. Uh, and said that the sun is at the center. Uh, these are standard things. I just want to quickly go through them. Uh, Galileo was the first person to use a telescope. The telescope had been invented around the 17th century, and he used it for astronomical observations. He discovered four moons of Jupiter. He found structures on the moon. He studied the phases of Venus. He observed uh, sunspots. And he also provided compelling evidence against the geocentric model, something which he had to, unfortunately, under pressure, recant. Uh, but I don't think he ever believed that uh, he did. He never believed his recantation, but he did that simply because he was tortured. Uh, uh, the next is during that period is uh, Kepler, who was who was fortunate enough to be an assistant to Tycho Brahe. So he was able. He had a wealth of observations taken when he worked as an assistant to Tycho Brahe, and he used these 
to come up with his famous laws. I'm not going to read them. You can see them there. They're all well known. Uh, on the second law, which is about the planet sweeping out equal areas, is illustrated in this figure on the right, uh, which shows a planet uh, very far away, close to Apelion. And uh, secondly, you see it at at perihelion, that is at the point of closest approach uh, to the sun. And uh, you can see that the, it says, the law is that the, it sweeps out equal areas in equal time. So when it's far away, it moves at a slower speed, but because of the distance, the area is comparable. It's exactly the same uh, to the one in the same time when it is closer to the sun. Anyway, let me move on now. Now, undoubtedly, Newton, apart from being a great astronomer, he's basically laid, has, is considered perhaps the person the, who's led the foundations of modern physics. His ideas were published in the Principia, uh, the mathematical principles of uh, natural philosophy, in which his laws of motion, uh, law of gravitation, and the basic principles of modern physics were there. Uh, of course, uh, his, uh, uh, his contributions to physics, calculates, and optics. Uh, there's no need for me to go into those. That's well known. And then we have Einstein, um, whose special theory of relativity, which uh, linked uh, matter, space, and mass, and later the general theory, which linked gravity with space-time, are closely linked. Uh, the general theory of relativity was uh, confirmed by a great uh, astrophysicist called Arthur Eddington at the time of an eclipse where the deflection of light during a total solar eclipse was measured. And this was found to agree with the prediction of general relativity. So some of the major milestones that have taken place in astrophysics, I'm just going to very fast go through them. I'm not going to waste time because they're not in a sense, very directly related, but uh, the expansion of the universe, uh, the idea that the universe actually originated in a big bang, and this confirmation by looking at the remnants of this glow from the bang, um, the discovery of the pulsar, which you see on the right, um, and this also contributed to, to two Nobel Prizes in 1974 and 93, uh, the discovery of dark matter, that is matter we, we can't actually see, but we know its presence uh, indirectly. The discovery of neutrinos coming out of the sun, the discovery of exoplanets, that is planets outside our solar system. Uh, these now thousands of uh, exoplanets have been observed and this led to a Nobel prize in 2019. The discovery of dark energy, uh, through the observation of the uh, expansion of the universe, which is accelerating, uh, the discovery of gravitational waves, which led to a Nobel Prize in 2017. I will talk a little bit about uh, gravitational waves in the context of a future international project in which India is participating. And the first picture, which you see on the right, of a black hole, which was made by the Event Horizon Telescope, which basically put together this image from many, many instruments all around the world. So now let's go to the uh, modern astronomy in India. And this is starts uh, with the use of the telescope. And the first recorded use of it was in 1651 by an Englishman called Jeremy Shackley, who was a follower of uh, Kepler, and he observed the transit of Mercury from Surat. In 1786, uh, an officer of the East India Company called William Petrie, uh, he was an amateur astronomer, and he started an observatory in his house. Uh, and subsequently, this observatory was taken over by the, the East India Company, and it was called, and it is called, it was called the Madras Observatory. Um, and on the right, we see a hand sketch of the Madras Observatory, which is taken from the 1792 report of the observatory. And it is from the archives of the Indian Institute of Astrophysics. Uh, a major discovery 
was made by astronomers of the Madras Observatory in 1868. And this was at the time of a total solar eclipse, uh, which was observed by two teams, one from Vunapurthi and the other from Masuli Patnam in Andhra. And uh, I will show you, uh, but before I show you that, I should also mention that in 1899, the British decided to pack up the Madras Observatory and shift it to Kodakanal uh, to focus more on studies of the sun. Um, one of the reasons, ostensibly, was that they felt that uh, a study of the sun would enable them to understand the effect of the sun on the Earth's climate. And this was particularly at a time when there had been some major famines in, in the country. And... Uh, I'm not sure whether this was the real reason, but certainly the whole emphasis shifted from observing stars to observing the sun. And on the left is the, it was, is a, is Poxon, who was the director of the observatory for, from 1861 to 1891, 1891. And he actually led the 1868 famous uh, uh, expedition in which helium was discovered. And on the right, you know, there, there were no four. So these, many of these uh, observations uh, that were recorded were hand-drawn. And he shows you a, a hand drawing of the solar eclipse, of the solar, of the solar spectrum taken during the time of the eclipse and shows you the location of the, of the line, which is this line, which is very close to this sodium line, which was of course well known in the solar spectrum. Now, as I mentioned that in 1899, the observatory was shifted to Kodak Canal, and this is a, a view of the Kodak Canal Observatory in the 1905. Unfortunately, uh, it's not possible to, to get this spectacular view because the, this, this view is completely obscured by a very dense forest. Uh, but you can see the observatory with, uh, with its instruments at that time. And uh, the image on the right is the is of Mitchie Smith who succeeded Poxon and he was the person during his time, the shift took place from uh, Madras to Kodakanal. Now in 1909, another major discovery took place and this was at Kodakanal and this was uh, a discovery in when, when uh, John Evershed, who was at that time a resident astronomer, he observed sunspots and he found that there was motion of gases actually coming out of these sunspots. And this figure is actually shows you, uh, it's a sketch of the effect of this motion on the solar spectrum. On the right, you can see John Evershed is a young man, unlike the image on the top. And there he's working with his assistant uh, at Kodak Canal. Now there were several other observatories uh, in pre-independence India. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but uh, let me just mention for the sake of completeness, the Takhta Singh G Observatory, which was uh, set up at the, at basically at the, well, through the efforts of a, of a Parsi gentleman called Negimbala. He was a lecturer in Elphinstone College and he convinced the Maharaja, Maharaja Takhta Singh G of Bhavnagar to make a donation uh, and this set the this observatory was was set up. It was closed down, unfortunately, in 1912 because of shortage of money. This is a familiar story, as we all know. And the Bhavnagar telescope was shifted to Kodak Canal, where it eventually became derelict because of the because of newer instruments that came up. Now. The next is the Nizami Observatory. Many of you might be familiar with it, especially those of you who go to Hyderabad, particularly Begum Pit. Uh, it was started uh, by Nawab uh, Zafar Jang um, as a private observatory. And uh, it was uh, after his death, it was taken over uh, uh, by a farman of the sixth Nizam, uh, Mir Mahbub Ali Khan Bahadur. And, uh, from a scientific point of view, it participated in a very, in a major uh, international program for mapping the sky. And uh, the sky survey made by this instrument led to observations of about 800,000 stars. 
The other observatories, which I should mention, are the Royal Observatory of Lucknow, the Royal Awadh Observatory. It was, for its time, one of the best equipped observatories, but unfortunately, um, it got destroyed uh, in 1857 at the time of the War of Independence. The other is the Trivandrum uh, Observatory, which was set up uh, through a grant by the Maharaja of uh, Travancore. It functioned for a short while, but uh, uh, it was extensively closed down because uh, somebody said that the instruments had not been properly aligned. Um, then we have the Dehradun Observatory, which uh, functioned uh, from 1878 to 1925. Uh, it fell into disuse around that time. Uh, and uh, then essentially uh, it sort of stopped functioning uh, as an astronomical observatory. And then we have the St. Xavier's College Observatory, which was in fact the first observatory of its kind in a university. It was set up in 1879, but uh, it was unfortunately very little astronomical work took place. And uh, eventually it was used for, for, for other activities, I believe meteorology. And so. uh, now we're going to again change gears and I'm going to talk about some of the early pioneers. Uh, one of the persons who, uh, in pre-independence India who had a major influence on science in India was Meghnath Saha. Um, he's uh, most well known for people who work in the field for developing a theory of thermal ionization in the atmosphere of the sun and stars. Uh, this, he developed an equation which allows you basically to understand the amount of ionization of the various chemical elements, hydrogen, helium, and so on, in the atmosphere of the sun. And it is a very powerful technique for studying what is happening in the atmosphere of the sun. Uh, on another level, uh, Saha was part of, a, he was, because he was a very influential and respected member of the scientific community, uh, he was asked to chair a community uh, to look into the reorganization of astronomy in India. And uh, he came up with what is known as the Saha plan, which suggested that the astronomical facilities in India should be updated. And in particular, uh, he made out a case for a powerful telescope to be set up. Now, his colleague, who of course, most of you must know, must have heard of, uh, Bose, Satyendra Nath Bose. Uh, he's uh, the most, uh, most well known for the Bose-Einstein statistics. Uh, that is basically a formula which uses quantum mechanics uh, to, uh, to basically study photons. And it is widely used today to study processes uh, in, in, in the stars, different in, in, the, in stars. Next, uh, I would like to turn to Homi Bhabha. Now, Homi Bhabha played, uh, he, although he did not himself work uh, directly in astrophysics, but I should point out that Homi Bhabha, uh, after independence, uh, played a very influential role in the, in the direction of science in India. He was the founder director of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research and he initiated major programs in astrophysics uh, that included cosmic rays, X-ray astronomy, radio astronomy. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he died in 1965 rather tragically in an air accident over Switzerland. We now uh, come to Vikram Sarabhai, who is um, the person who most well known for setting up a space program in India. He was the founder director of the Physical Research Laboratory of Ahmedabad, which was established in 1947. Uh, he also established a center in Trivandrum and the Space Application Center in Ahmedabad. So his influence basically today, what we have in space, uh, we owe a lot of that to his pioneering work. Now let me turn to somebody with whom I had a close personal contact and that is uh, Venu Bapu. 
Um, he was the founder director of the Indian Institute of Astrophysics. He had actually joined, come back to India after his PhD from Harvard, and he first went to Nenital. And then later on, he came as the director of the Kuda Canal Observatory. And subsequently, when the observatory was um, taken over by the Department of Science and Technology, he was the founding director of the Indian Institute of Astrophysics. Uh, he had a, a grand vision for setting up uh, optical facilities in the country. Um, it was largely due to his efforts that um, uh, the Venu Bapu Observatory in Kavalur, which houses the 2.3 meter telescope, was set up. This telescope was uh, commissioned uh, in 1986, but unfortunately, Bapu was not alive. He had died uh, in 1982. But uh, his 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 efforts, if it wasn't for his efforts, we wouldn't have had this observatory. Uh, on a scientific level, he's most famous for something called the Wilson-Bapu effect. I don't want to go into the technicality of it, but uh, it's uh, it's something which relates basically the calcium line to the emission of a star and also to the discovery of a comet which bears his name. Um, as I mentioned that on a personal note, I met uh, Venu Bapu in 1977 uh, when I had just completed my PhD. And... Um, he offered me a position at the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, which I gratefully accepted. And ever since then, I've been associated with the Institute. Now, let me turn to Govind Sarup, who is uh, regarded by many as the father of radio astronomy in India. He built up radio astronomy basically from scratch in India from the early 1960s. And the first uh, telescope that he built was the Uti radio telescope in the 1960s. And then subsequently, he had a major role. And in fact, he, it, I think it was largely due to his pioneering efforts that the giant meter radio telescope, uh, GMRT, as it's popularly called in Pune, was set up in the 1990s. And it's a major facility for radio astronomy. Now, let me just turn to Indian Lorette's Nobel laureates in astrophysics. Uh, before I talk about uh, Chandrasekhar, I should mention that uh, C.V. Raman, uh, who won the Nobel Prize in 1930 for the discovery of the Raman effect, which is basically the scattering of light through a transparent medium. Uh, in his earlier, when he started his career in Calcutta, was uh, was an active member of the Astronomical Society of India and uh, was, uh, was actually, he had a great interest in passion for astronomy and perhaps uh, this is not so well known. But let me now turn to Chandrasekhar who was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1983 and the citation read for theoretical studies of the physical processes of importance to the structure and evolution of stars. Uh, Technically, uh, he derived a stable limit for stars, which is bears his name. It's called the Chandrasekhar limit. Now, again, I can't resist narrating a, a personal anecdote, which illustrates uh, how meticulous he was as far as when it came to detail. And this was, I had been asked to deliver a talk in Chicago, and I wrote to Professor Chandrasekhar to ask him whether I could drop in and see him. And um, his secretary replied saying that that would be fine. And could I come at on a certain day at 10 a.m.? And at 9.30, I got a phone call from his secretary and said, oh, I'm really sorry to tell you that Professor Chandrasekhar will not be there at 10 o'clock. And he's asked me to convey his profound regrets. However, he will be there at 10 past 10. I mean, <laughs> this, this totally flabbergasted me. Okay, now let's move on to the main astronomy centers in India. This is a long list. Uh, I, I, I thought I would just rather uh, show you the slides so you can just look, see, get an idea that astronomy today is, uh, astronomy research today is conducted in a large number of institutes and also in universities. Uh, so let me begin again with Kodak Canal, which I had talked about earlier. On the left top panel, you see the old instruments, which are over a hundred years old. 
The middle one is the main telescope, which was used for solar research for, for several decades. It was set up in the 1960s. And on the right and on the lower left panels, you see some new instrumentation. And on the right, uh, you see a beautiful lake, which is the Pangong Lake. And you can see, you can, I think you can discern that there are some instruments there, which are used for site testing of the new solar telescope, which I will talk about later on. On the left is the Venubapu telescope, which I already talked to you about. And on the right are some uh, fairly spectacular images taken by this telescope. The, up, the top panel shows you an image of the galaxy and the bottom shows you the collision of, uh, it's a deep impact with, uh, with the comet. Now let us turn to another observatory, uh, which was set up around uh, 2000. And this is the uh, Indian Astronomical Observatory at Hanle, which has the, which has the two meter telescope. And this telescope is actually remoted, uh, operated remotely from Bangalore, from Hoskote via satellite link. So this is, uh, it's been around for a long time and it has actually contributed to extensively to research in astrophysics. Uh, and again, just as an illustration, uh, we see some images taken by this telescope. Uh, now, turning uh, to other institutes, uh, we have the Arya Bhatta Research Institute of Observational Sciences, ARIES. Uh, and the top left panel shows you the largest uh, optical telescope in India. This was procured a few years ago, five or six years ago. It's been functioning ever since. It's uh, the 3.6 meter optical telescope. It is near Nenital in Devasthal. And on the right, are the telescopes which have been there earlier on. Then there are, uh, very quickly, let me just mention that there are other also instruments. Uh, on the left is a the telescope of PRL at Mount Abu. On the right is the two meter Ayuka telescope near Pune, which is used these days primarily for, for teaching. On the bottom left uh, shows you the island observatory of the Udaipur Solar Observatory. And on the right, you can see, you see a collapsible dome. And this is the new or the recent uh, half meter multi-application solar telescope, which is used for studying the sun. So this is uh, a new facility which came up very recently. And then we have uh, an, an old telescope, which has been there for a long time, belonging to Osmania University at the Japal, Japal Rangapur Observatory, which is 55 kilometers from Hyderabad. Now, again, uh, I'm not going to go into the details. I already mentioned that uh, earlier on about the giant meter radio telescope, uh, which is uh, near Pune. Uh, it is one of the largest solar radio telescopes in this uh, at, the, at meter wavelengths. Uh, the right is the Uti radio telescope, which I mentioned about, which was set up by Govan, Dr. Govind Saroop in the 1960s. And the lower panel is a, a radio telescope belonging to the New Suit of Astrophysics, which is used mainly for studying the sun. Now, turning from, uh, turning to space, uh, in 2015, uh, India's first dedicated astronomy satellite called AstroSat was launched and um, it consists the basic idea uh, scientific objectives were to look for black holes study magnetic fields and neutron stars uh, look at star formation it was a it was a multi-wavelength uh, um, satellite so it was looking at the sun in different wavelengths and this image below is of rather spectacular image taken by the ultraviolet imaging telescope. Uh, and this shows you a faint galaxy, uh, which is supposed to, which is uh, 3 million light years away. Now, let me, where well, I'm getting a little bit, uh, I have to catch up on time a bit. Let me just talk about some uh, new facilities that are coming up. 
Uh, the, this the first one is again uh, we're, it's a space mission, but this time it's a dedicated space mission to study the sun. It's called Aditya. Uh, it's going to be launched very soon, next year most likely. And its main idea is to study why is the solar corona, which is the outer atmosphere of the sun, so hot. It uh, aims to study the nature of solar magnetic storms. Solar magnetic storms are very important because they affect the Earth, they affect what happens around us, they create disturbances in the Earth's atmosphere to look at the properties of solar energetic pro, uh, particles and so on. Now, the National Large Solar Telescope is a project in which I have been closely associated from its very inception. Uh, it's a, a two meter telescope uh, and the basic idea of this telescope is to be able to look at tiny features. And when we say tiny, uh, we mean of, of the sizes of 45 kilometers. Now that's a very small distance at, when we look at on the sun from, from earth to be able to study a structure which is of the size of 45 kilometers is in fact a great achievement. And this is the idea, this is one of the major objectives of the solar telescope. Uh, it will be located, it's been, it has gone through extensive uh, scrutiny. We've done, as I showed you some instruments, we have done some extensive site survey at a place called Merak, which is on the Pangong Lake in Ladakh. Uh, when completed, it will be the second largest solar telescope in the world. Uh, this is, uh, this image gives you a, just a schematic layout of what the telescope will look like. I don't want to go into the technical details, so I will just move on. Uh, and this is a picture of a sunspot taken by the world's largest solar telescope, uh, which is in Hawaii. And it shows you in intricate detail the structure of a sunspot. I mean, so far we have never been able to see sunspots. We have been able to look at sunspots with such minute detail. And it is hoped that the solar telescope will be able to provide you this level of detail or comparable level of detail. Uh, I should mention that uh, presently uh, the telescope is uh, awaiting formal um, government uh, uh, sanction. Uh, it is expected that this will come in the next few months. And once it comes, it should take about three to four years before the telescope will be completed. Now, India, in addition to uh, its own facilities, is also taking part in some major international programs. And I'm going to discuss three of them before I close. The first one is India's participation in the 30 meter telescope. Uh, this is uh, artist view. The telescope hasn't come up, so what we all we have is an artist view of what it might look like. It is likely to be located in La Palma on Tenerife in Spain, and expected to begin operations around uh, 2026. It will consist. It's a segmented telescope, so it's not one monolithic mirror of 30 meters, but it consists of of mirror segments, uh, almost 500 of them in which India is going to be a member of an international consortium. There are about four or five other members. Uh, it will build, contribute 100 mirror segments to these 500. So it will contribute about 20% of the mirrors, uh, in addition to some other, other, also some other systems. And um, when completed, it will have a factor. It will be three times better than the best telescopes that you have today. Uh, and the idea is to be able to look at uh, planets uh, very far away. I showed you, uh, uh, I, I mentioned already about exosolar planets. Uh, uh, also to be able to understand the expansion of the universe much better. So, so as to get a better idea of what is dark energy and to study in detail the structure of galaxies. The next uh, uh, mega project in which India is already uh, participating, has already agreed to participate, is called, it's a, it's a massive uh, radio telescope. It's called the Square Kilometer Array. It's a radio telescope which will correspond to, it's, it's actually different, lots and lots of seg uh, dishes, which will provide you 1 million square meters of collecting area, which is 50 times better than the most sensitive telescopes today. Uh, it will look at uh, 
try and understand the evolution of the big stars and galaxies after the Big Bang, that is when the universe began. Uh, it'll look at mag magnetism, it'll look at the nature of gravity, and it's also going to try and look for extraterrestrial life, to, at least to see whether we can uh, get a better, get some more information about that. Uh, it will be at two sites in the Southern Hemisphere, in South Africa and Australia. The headquarters will be in the UK, and India is a member of this consortium. There are 14 members totally, um, and more members are likely to join later. And the main contribution of India will be to develop the software, which is basically the brains behind the whole telescope. Um, and the nodal agency is the National Center for Radio Astrophysics, NCRA, which is part of TIFR. Uh, and the first observations are expected to begin in 2027. And finally, I'm going to wind up by talking about the Indian participation in LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Uh, it's already contributed to a major discovery, which led to, I early, as I mentioned earlier, to a Nobel Prize for the discovery of gravitational waves. But there's still a lot of work to be done. And uh, India will, it will also provide one of the, will provide a third instrument. There are already two instruments, uh, and India will provide another one. And uh, I think uh, I, I've already crossed. I was supposed to talk for 45 minutes. I've already spoken for 50. Uh, once again, uh, let me thank uh, all of you for giving me this chance to give this talk and to the NGMA and the Gandhi Center. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, there is one question. I'm just showing it to you. Okay. The question is, how can a normal person visit these observatories or do we need special permission? Uh, uh, normally, uh, most of these observatories uh, have a have actually a day for public viewing. So on those days, anybody can go and visit. But if you want to visit outside of those hours, uh, I think uh, it doesn't really require, it doesn't require a lot of uh, effort. I think you just need to perhaps contact the, um, uh, contact the management of these institutes uh, there's always somebody who's responsible for these affairs and just ask for permission. Uh, regularly, uh, many of the institutes have programs which are open to the public. They have public talks. Uh, so these are already open to them. But if anybody really wants to go and uh, look at the instruments and try to understand, um, you know, what is the, what's going on, I don't think that should be too difficult. You just need to contact and ask them. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I would now request uh, the director, Ms. Nasneen Banu, to conclude the program and also thank the speaker for today's uh, uh, virtual talk. Ma'am, up to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Darshan. And uh, first and foremost, let me thank uh, the speaker of the day, uh, Dr. Siraj Hassan, for this uh, very, very informative educative and comprehensive presentation, highlighting uh, the broad spectrum, wider view, starting from the Greek astronomy to Indian astronomy, then to Arab astronomy. And uh, Professor Hassan also discussed about various Indian astronomers, then medieval observatories, including Jantar Mantar, then the birth of modern astronomy, major milestones. I mean, it was very, very comprehensively covered and coming up to the new initiatives and interesting projects in which government of India is doing independently or uh, collaborating. So thank you very, very much, sir. You spared your valuable time and prepared such a comprehensive presentation for our viewers. And uh, we are indeed grateful to you. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, today's talk is in uh, continuation of NGMA's uh, India's Heritage Talk Series. 
being organized in collaboration with the Gandhi Center for Science and Human Values. Uh, some of the topics that uh, we have covered in this series so far are India's heritage and sculpture, which was done by Professor Sharda Srinivasan. We also uh, did a talk on spiritual heritage of India, which was by uh, Ambassador Alan Nazareth. We also spoke about India's scientific heritage in medicine and surgery. That was a beautiful presentation by Professor M.S. Veliathan. Then uh, India's heritage in rock and mural art by Benoit K. Behel. And of course, today's uh, uh, talk uh, by Professor Siraj Hassan on India's heritage in uh, astrophysics. Uh, besides, we also organized a, ta a talk on Gandhian uh, architect Laurie Baker, which was uh, by Sri Prahlad uh, Mahishi. Uh, as we celebrate Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav, which is an initiative by the government of India to commemorate and uh, celebrate India at 75, uh, which you all may know by now, it's a celebration of the people of this country. It's, it's a celebration of our collective achievements our rich and diverse heritage and our aspirations. And GMA intends uh, to host a few more talks in this series in near future. Request all of you to subscribe to our social media pages and uh, regularly check our website to keep yourself updated about our future events. Um, let me also take this opportunity to thank uh, Ambassador Ellen Nazareth, former Chairman Gandhi and Center for Science and Human Values, who has taken keen interest and uh, has been instrumental in curating and presenting India's heritage talk series in collaboration with NGMA, uh, thereby ensuring wider public outreach. And last uh, but not the least, I would like to thank our deputy curator, uh, Darshan Kumar, for coordinating and putting this all together, as well as for the design of creatives and e invites. And uh, thank you uh, very much, one and all, for joining us uh, this evening. And once again, special thanks uh, to the speaker of the day, uh, Professor Siraj Hassan, for this uh, very, very informative, educative, and uh, wonderful, well-researched talk, sir. I would like you, I would request you to kindly share a copy of your presentation with us uh, so that we can share with our viewers, if you don't mind that, and uh, also for a future documentation purpose. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much.